Hello and welcome everyone to day two of Bitwise, the show where we build a complete software and hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, today, as promised yesterday, um, we'll start looking into actually doing some, some real C programming um, for the compiler, the very rudiments of, of the compiler. Um, yesterday, I kind of implied that I would do a presentation style walkthrough of parsing from first principles. Uh, I started writing a uh, document uh, let's see I started writing a document uh, but it became like I mean it became a whole thing and uh, I like I can't really cover the basics better than uh, Niklaus Viet does in his compiler construction book which is freely available so I decided that uh, I'm just going to basically point you guys to um, to chapters two through uh, section one of chapter four which is only 12 pages of his book, you can download the PDFs at this URL, and uh, it covers, you know, kind of lexical analysis for you know regular expression type stuff, and um, uh, context-free grammars uh, and how to parse them with recursive descent. Chapter four actually covers not just recursive descent; it kind of covers other techniques and has a comparative analysis of them. But uh, what he uses in his own compilers and what we'll be using is just handwritten recursive descent parsing. And so really, you only need to read those 12 pages. And I would say that if you, uh, if you read and understand those 12 pages, which there's, it's an entry level treatment, it's nothing fancy. If you understand it and you practice it, you will almost know everything you'll need to know about compilers and the rest, or, or parsing rather, and the rest you will it's just stuff you'll pick up as you write parsers and figure out uh, small tricks for structuring them in a way that that fits your style. So rather than you know kind of doing a fancy uh, presentation, I thought let's just point you guys to that. I would have used this as a reference anyway. Um, and then I thought we would just jump in and do some programming because if I keep just doing presentation stuff, I'm going to be super exhausted because those take a lot of prep time. And uh, I also think it's easier to just start doing some programming and then as we run into concepts that may be unfamiliar, I will, I will just sort of on the spot try to give an explanation. Uh, and I promised I would assign you guys homework. So, kind of based on you having read um, these 12 pages, which I think you should be able to do very quickly, um, I will be assigning a simple, not that simple, maybe a pretty simple parsing problem that you can work on. Uh, you don't have to do it in a day or whatever. You can just sort of do it on the back burner uh, to make sure you put these ideas into practice. So anyway, with that out of the way, let's just jump right in. Um, so as I wrote in the FAQ, I'll be using Visual Studio for most of um, most of my own work, um, unless I'm specifically testing on other platforms. But obviously, you can use whatever uh, whatever you want. I'm going to make make sure I write portable C, and and if I uh, Hang on. And if I fail to write a portable C, I'll fix it. Uh, maybe not the same day if I don't have any a quick way of testing it until we have some more automated builds. But um, I'll, I'll make you know I'm, I'm planning on making everything perfectly portable by default. Um, so right. So I, I just put in a hello world file in the uh, in bitwise slash ion slash ion dot C. So it's just this file and. The Visual Studio project is not going to be checked in. This is just a skeleton project. Um, and I'm just going, for a while, we're just going to have one big C file so we don't have to worry about maintaining, you know, build, like lists of build files for, you know, if you're on a different operating system. And a little bit later, we'll get that more organized so that um, we don't have everything in one big file. All right. Um, as I think you'll be seeing me doing this a lot, and I, I guess many of you are not used to sort of debugger-driven development, uh, I want to say a little bit about that up front. Because even though I think it's second nature to a lot of people who grew up on Windows doing C programming, um, most mo I think most people with a Unix background treat the debugger, especially for C, because GDB is, I mean, it's, it's fine, but uh, usability is maybe not great. Uh, in terms of just like integrating it into your text editing and testing flow, um, people usually only bust it out if they have a bug to fix, as opposed to just writing code and seeing how it works and getting an idea of what's going on. 
Um, the way I and a lot of other people use debuggers and IDEs especially is that we treat it more like a, uh, a REPL in, you know, in Lisp or Python or, um, you know, where you're constantly, you're constantly re-executing code from scratch and you're stepping through it and you're, uh, you're doing that kind of dynamic workflow, even though obviously this is a statically typed language and compiled and all that stuff. So I just want to, um, in case you're totally unfamiliar with this, I just want to give a very basic uh, overview of the kinds of things that I, you'll see me doing. And I'm, I, you know, if I didn't mention this up front, I wouldn't even realize that it might be confusing. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of standard uh, keybinds. And uh, the one I'll be using all the time is when I'm just in text editing mode and I want to run something. Um, almost always, I have a specific piece of code in mind that I will want to validate or something. So for example, suppose I'd just written this printf and this was a mysterious thing that I didn't, I had to sort of make sure that it works as expected. Um, you know, you kind of have a few different options for launching the program into the debugger. You can just type F5 and, uh, you know, it, it, it runs without uh, halting. Sorry, that came out wrong. Um, you can set breakpoints with, toggle breakpoints with F9 and, if, and now if you use F5, it will stop there. And then you can use uh, Shift F5 to stop debugging. Um, if I now run again and it stops on that breakpoint, uh, sometimes you make a change while the debugger is still technically running and you just want to rerun from scratch. And without having to type Shift 5 and then F5 again, you can just do Control F5. Isn't that Control F5? What am I? It's not working. Uh, Oh, control shift F5. Control shift F5 to basically stop and then restart, um, which is useful when you're just sort of iterating on a small section of code. But actually the one that I use 90% of the time is, is neither. Uh, the one I like to use is, um, um, let's do something like this. Um, I actually don't like to have too many breakpoints unless there's a good reason for it when I just want to stop on a specific line. I always use uh, the keybind control F10. Let's see what they call that technically. Is it not even here? Okay. But control F10 is by far the most useful keybind in my opinion. Um, what it does is it, it starts the program and it runs until it hits the line your cursor is on when you start it. And so when you're working on a piece of code and you just want to you know, execute all the startup until that point, and then you want to see what's going on, that's the keybind to use. Um, by default, when you install Visual Studio, Control F10 is going to usually give a, a prompt, like a pop-up uh, modal uh, window, where it will ask like, you know, to con for you to confirm or something like that. So re maybe confirm to recompile if something has changed since last build. Uh, if you set that to checked by default, it will always recompile any changed code uh, before launching the debugger. And that's what you want when you have this workflow. And that actually makes a big difference, in my opinion, because having to constantly, you know, get rid of these windows and just do the same thing over and over really disrupt the flow when you're just kind of banging on a piece of code like this. Um, all right. So, yeah, so I guess the other binds, which most people will know about, is there's step over, which is F10. There's step into, which is F11, which steps in. It's the equivalent of step in GDB. Step, uh, step over, I guess, is next in GDB. Um, step out is finish in GDB, right? Um, in case you're coming from GDB. But anyway, so there's kind of equivalent versions of that here. Um, so nothing super deep. The other thing you'll see me doing a lot, which may be unfamiliar, um, is I like to look at disassembly quite a lot of the time. I mean, not for no reason, but you know, uh, as a matter of course. And so uh, you can either right click and I thought there was a, oh, go to disassembly. That's the slow way of doing it if you're a mouse user. Uh, and what you can see is um, you can see the disassembly next to the corresponding uh, C code, and when you're running optimized rather than in debug, the correspondence between the source code lines and the assembly lines are going to be very tenuous, so don't take that too seriously in optimized builds. 
But uh, when you're in this disassembly window, the usual meaning of F10 and F11 changes. And in GDB, that's the equivalent of next I and step I, because now you're doing, rather than doing line level stepping or whatever, you're doing instruction level stepping. So F10, you can see, rather than treating that as a single uh, granule for stepping, we now do instruction level stepping. Um, and, I, and I can type, uh, was it shift uh, shift F11 to step out? And you can see here, this is actually the CRT thing that invokes our main function. And uh, if we're adventurous, we can step out even further, or we can just maybe. And uh, as you can see, this is in the CRT. Anyway, I mean that's a digression, but you can see it's kind of useful to be able to just uh, quickly jump into disassembly, uh, even if you're not like doing optimization or something. Um, I like to do it. Uh, to make sure the compiler is doing roughly what I have in mind. Uh, but it just, anyway, in case you ever see me doing that, um, that's how you do that. Uh, the, the, the other thing in the same vein, actually, let's just open this again, is the memory window, which I think is uh, by default is Alt-6. So um, let's see here. Um, yeah, so anyway, the memory window you can put in, I thought you could put in address expressions. I'm not sure why it's not going to the right uh, address, but anyway, you can look at memory. Um, there's of course, there's the autos window, which is kind of a combination. That one is a little bit weird uh, because it's sort of a do what I mean type window that tries to infer certain things to show you based on context, which doesn't usually show you what you actually want. There's locals where you can see the current value of um, of local variables, and there's watch where you, you know you can type in um, you can type in I don't know various you can type in variables if, if they're not in the locals window like you want to look at a global um, you can you can type in expressions um, and they'll be evaluated. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. So anyway, uh, just some, some quick workflow stuff before we jump in. Um, so you, so you're not totally confused because I'm not going to call that out as I'm proceeding. It'll just be assumed that you are able to, to make sense of that. So, all right. Um, all right, let's just jump in. Um, as I thought about what we should be doing today, I realized that even to do basic lexing, which is the first thing you would logically do, uh, you need some sort of string interning to make it reasonable. And because of that, I don't want to just, like, I mean, this is a long-term project and I am hoping to have you guys build familiarity with techniques we'll be applying over and over. And so even though we will be doing parsing today, I think there's some basic, um, some basic, uh, some basic stuff we have to build first. Some, 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 a few data structures we have to build first. And they won't be like kind of final production quality versions of those data structures. We'll return to them subsequently, but we need at least basic versions of things like dynamic arrays and, uh, uh, and maybe not even a real hash table, but just a linear, a linear set of, of, of intern strings that we can do some kind of lookup on. Um, and I thought maybe the, the first interesting thing to cover is uh, stretchy buffers, which is one of the most useful C programming techniques um, that I personally have learned about in the last 10 years. And it's very simple. And I don't know who came up with this specific formulation. It involves a few simple tricks um, to make it very usable in C uh, to do, you know, dynamically growable arrays in a way that has, uh, has a few pitfalls in use but it doesn't require macros to generate different versions for different types. It lets you do indexing uh, of, a, of a buffer directly like it would be if it was a C buffer. Uh, you don't have to use, you know, kind of accessor functions to do simple array lookups. Um, and it can be implemented in, you know, 30 lines of code for a basic, for a basic implementation that, that should just work. And we'll be using these again and again. They're, like I said, I think one of the most useful building blocks if you're a C programmer. Uh, and if you have, like, it uses some macros that are going to be a little bit scary, maybe. Um, and, uh, 
and uh, so so don't be don't be too turned off by that. So anyway, the idea behind stretchy buffers is that um, let me actually write the interface before we look at the implementation. Suppose you want to have a buffer in ar of an arbitrary type. So you want to have a uh, a buffer of um, of integers. Uh, your only job is to declare an int pointer buff, and you have to serial initial initialize it. I guess you do using all of your being a little more idiomatic. So your job, if you want to have a buffer, a, a dynamic global buffer, uh, you know, in a local variable, in a local stack frame, or in a global variable, or in some other uh, storage, all you have to do is declare a pointer of the right type and serial initialize it. And then at that point, you have uh, a set of functions. Actually, but actually macros, um, which uh, you can use as follows. Um, I don't know, if, uh, you know, just random numbers like this. So you can just pass, um, you can just pass this name of the buffer directly as the first argument, and then you pass the argument you want to push on the buffer. Uh, you know, and this would be something like uh, std vector pushback. Um, and note that it starts out as null, but essentially the way it works under the hood, as you'll see, is that if you pass in a null pointer, um, it's going to treat it as a zero length buffer. It's been unallocated, but semantically corresponds to a zero length buffer. And it's going to actually allocate a buffer for you on demand to accommodate the request of pushing something. And it's going to reassign the new buffer pointer to buff itself. Um, so now buff actually points to a buffer with the first element containing 42. Um, and so that's why you need it to be a macro because it's actually reassigning is reassigning the variable um, when it needs to reallocate. Um, and so anyway, that's how you push stuff. And um, if you want to just do iteration, you can just do it like this. You know, you would just use this bufflin accessor, and uh, here's the nice part: you don't have to use an accessor for indexing because um, this is really just a real buffer pointer. The way it actually works, as you'll see, is that in memory, the header that stores information about the length and the capacity of the buffer is stored immediately prior to the buffer pointer in memory, so you can do some pointer arithmetic to subtract off those offsets and recover the the the, the, the capacity and length. So that just works. And then if, if, well, you shouldn't actually free memory before exiting and see in most cases for performance, but you can certainly do that. So you can do a free. So this would be, I say the, I'd say the, the three basic functions you want a stretchy buffer to have. Um, and so I thought to start, we would implement the part of a stretchy buffer required to, to do these three operations. And that will turn out to basically be all the under the hood stuff we'll need. We can do a few other operations, but each of them is a one liner. So, um, Let's just let's show how that's done. So, like I said, the um, the actual representation of an allocated buffer in memory, even though to the user code you just see the buffer pointer to the actual payload, there's there's more stuff before it in memory, and so there's actually a capacity and a length. I guess I should. Um, should yeah. Let's just import some standard stuff here that will, yeah, for now that's probably fine. Um, so there's this stuff, and then there's the actual buffer. And I'm going to be using this char buff zero notation, um, which is new in C99. Previously, you might have done this with a one byte element. The point behind this uh, way of writing it is that the actual buffer is not going to be length one or length zero. But this is basically going to be a prefix of the actual in-memory data structure, which can have arbitrary length beyond the last element. Um, but this lets us use the uh, pointer, the array to pointer decay uh, feature in C to kind of easily address the tail, even though it's longer than length one or length zero. So anyway, um, so that's what that looks like. And then given a um, given a buffer. Uh, pointer, so B is a buffer pointer. Uh, we have to do the pointer arithmetic I mentioned to subtract off 
um, basically the size of those two fields that precede the buffer. And so we'll convert it to a char pointer in order to be able to do bitewise pointer arithmetic. And then we'll do, yeah, offset of, in case you guys don't know this, um, oh, it's up 12. Um, offset of is a very simple macro. It's not a built-in that just does uh, some, some a, a few tricks to, um, to calculate the byte offset of a field within a struct. So if you do offset of buff header uh, buff, it's going to basically figure out relative to the beginning of a, of a buff header struct, how many bytes in do you have to go before buff actually starts? So in this case, if size T is um, say eight bytes each, or it would be 16. So you would be subtracting 16 from the, uh, from the buffer pointer in order to get the header. Uh, and then at this point, we still have a, a char pointer. So we want to expose it as a buff header pointer. Um, and now given this, we can, and by the way, I'm going to use this convention that when we have this kind of type prefix or module prefix like buff, a uh, single underscore is going to be used for kind of public functions that you're supposed to look at. Double underscore is going to be used for things that are kind of under the hood stuff that you probably shouldn't think too hard about if you're just trying to use the API. Um, but then in order to implement buff lang, we have two cases to consider. Either, um, either the buffer is null, uh, the buffer, yeah, the buffer value is null. Um, like this case, which is basically typically what happens when uh, you this is the first time you're you're doing something and you haven't allocated anything yet so um, in that case well let's see it this way if uh, if the buffer is non-null then we can actually construct the header and compute the length but if the if b is null then we're just going to say well that corresponds to a zero length uh, buffer and we can do the same thing for uh, for the capacity All right, um, let's see. So what were the functions we wanted to implement? Uh, len push, right, and free. So let's do push. That's really the one that forces most of the other code we'll be writing. Um, so push takes a buffer and an element to push. And in the simplest case, it's just like a normal C, um, you know, a C array append which you know you can do kind of neatly with uh, with this, and I guess I should do something like this. Um, where you know you're just you're indexing the array uh, and addressing you know the the element beyond the current array length, right? So if the array has length ten. And because we're zero-based indexing, index 10 is actually one beyond. It's the 11th element, essentially. And so we're, uh, we're assigning to that what we want to push, and then we're incrementing it after the fact. So this is just a nice expression uh, for doing this increment. It's a little bit, you know, since we're doing these macros, we'll want to keep things compact uh, rather than, you know, I might not write it exactly like this in a different context. Uh, although, I mean, I feel like this link, link plum plus, this kind of, buff len plus plus equals x that idiom is kind of a standard C thing. So it's good to be aware of. Um, but anyway, um, this is the case where it's allocated or not when it's allocated, but rather when there's enough room because of the, so it, we're really, this has to be conditional on the capacity being sufficient. So we'll write a function called fit um, where we will We'll specify, this is just another helper macro. We're going to specify the B again, and then we're going to say the additional amount of elements we want to make room for. And we're just going to use a C comma expression, since this is a macro. Uh, we don't want to make this like a curly brace macro. Um, uh, so we'll use the comma, uh, comma expression operator in order to sequence expressions. And so, you know, here we're, we're fitting one more element and the post condition of this macro is essentially that we're allowed to do this because now the capacity can accommodate the, the incrementation. And, uh, and then we actually put it in there. And so I think that should be it. Um, so then let's go and implement that, um, that fit function. And what it's going to do 
is uh, it's going to do a check. It's going to check whether the current capacity plus n, um, no, sorry, if the current length plus n fits within the capacity. Um, so let's see, does this make sense? If the length, so for example, if the length is zero and the capacity is zero, zero plus one is not less than or equal to zero. So that seems right in that case. Um, so if, uh, if this is true, I think we do nothing because then it already fits. We don't have to do anything. Otherwise we have to, um, we have to grow. Uh, and this is where, you know, the macro tricks come in or the fact that we're using macros is really important again. Uh, because we have to grow the buffer and in order to grow the buffer we need to know the actually let's let me factor this out um so let's write this kind of predicate macro that will be true if something fits and then we check whether <clears throat> Sorry, we check whether the additional stuff fits. If it does fit, then we're good. Otherwise, we have to um, grow the buffer to accommodate at least that much storage. And um, we also need to know the element size because the length and capacity are measured in a number of elements, not number of bytes. So we have to also pass that I should do the usual macro things here. Um, and what, what should we do with the return value of this? Well, um, we have to assign it to B. So it's going to return the new, the new buffer uh, and we will assign it to B. Does that make sense? I think so. All right, so let me just run through this in my head. Compute the header base pointer from the buffer pointer. Um, given a buffer and an additional length, check whether it fits within the capacity. In order to fit a given amount of additional length, we check whether it already fits. If so, we do nothing. Otherwise, we grow the buffer by that amount, at least that amount. And we pass in the element size of the array. And then we assign the return value to the L value. Um, OK, let's say that's OK. So then we have to implement buff grow, which is going to be a function. Um, not only is it going to be a function for cleanliness, but also a small efficiency note, since you'll be doing a lot of pushes and stuff like that all over your code, you don't want this kind of inline macro expansion to have a bunch of gnarly stuff. You want to keep that tight so that the rare case where it actually has to grow the buffer is sort of on a cold, you know, it's, it's kind of a function call that, um, that doesn't pollute the instruction cache and stuff like that. So um, both for cleanliness and for um, code quality, uh, like uh, machine code quality, this is a good factorization. So, all right, so what are we given? We're given an existing buffer. Um, I'll make it a void so it doesn't have to be cast. Um, given an existing buffer, and what was the second argument? So that's the new length we want and the element size. Um, I guess we have to compute the new capacity and we will use the usual exponential doubling uh, idea for amortized constant time pushes. Uh, and we'll add one to avoid the annoying uh, capacity equals zero case. And then we also have to make sure that um, we accommodate at least enough for the new length. Right? I think that makes sense. At least enough for the new length. I guess we have to define max. I can't remember what's the C standard library.
yeah, there's no C, C standard library equivalent. I don't know. I, I, I knew that. I don't know why I thought there might be. All right, so let's just write a max function. If x is greater than or equal to y, um, then x else y. I gotta over parenthesize that. Um, all right, so take the max of these two and the post condition is that uh, the new capa the new length is less than or equal to the new capacity. I guess I should mention that too. I'm kind of an assert fiend for a lot of this stuff. So I like, especially when developing some of these, you, you can maybe comment, like, I don't know, you might not want to compile them in, right? Uh, especially, oh, assert usually gets compiled out at runtime. But um, especially when writing, even just to communicate my thinking to myself about invariants and stuff, I always write these things. So that's essentially what we're trying to accomplish, right? In terms of what we absolutely need to be true. Even if we didn't do exponential doubling, as long as this was true, uh, we could still validly do this buffer append. Uh, of course, if we didn't do the doubling, then we wouldn't, we would get quadratic time rather than, uh, well, we would get linear time push uh, rather than uh, amortized constant time. But anyway, right, so compute the new capacity. Uh, and given the new capacity, we can calculate the actual byte size. Um, and given that, we should be able to reallocate the buffer. Um, so that's going to be the thing we're actually going to be allocating and whatnot is not going to be actually, you know, the buffer itself is going to be the buffer header because that's where the allocation was made. So the new header, I guess, will be, we have to do a conditional. If, if buff exists, then we will realloc, so we don't have to do a uh, standalone, a, you know, it will it will do for us both the malloc of the new size and the copy of the old and the freeing of the old, or an in-place growth if it can accomplish it. But it's mostly just for brevity rather than, you know, in-place in growth efficiency. Um, and so we will take the old header and pass it to that. And we will pass new size. And otherwise, we're just going to do a fresh malloc. And now that we have this new thing, because we did a realloc, um, well, I guess I have to be a little bit careful because if it's mallocked, it's not zeroed. I guess I can do calloc. No, I don't want to spend time zeroing the, the tail of elements that are unused. Um, okay, so, well, we definitely want to do this, um, but we have to make, if we, yeah, let's just do it with a different approach. Um, So if we malloc it, then it's not going to be initialized with anything. So we have to set the length to zero. Um, the capacity. is going to be set the same way regardless. And then we're going to return that. Let's see if that compiles. left, oh, well, I guess you can do this. Um, let's see, make a pointer. That's the devoid star. Okay, 
just make sure this is actually this is the fun of macro expansions I th it may not actually be the thing i thought it was in terms of what it's complaining about left operand must be l value that buff is certainly an l value right <laughs> so push oh it's this one No? Let's try to take some stuff out. Um, dun, dun, dun. Let's see, buffet. Um, Okay, I guess it was a precedence issue. Good times. By the way, it's been like a year and a half since I did all the, the old live streaming sessions. Um, so you're going to see me take, I guess, a little bit of a while in order to get kind of comfortable coding and debugging live on stream. So, so please bear with me until I get my, my footing again. Um, so buffling, I guess, is also, oh yeah, we definitely can't do buff, buff len plus plus. Well, you, yeah, I guess the problem with doing that is it's not an L value. Um, and you kind of want it to be in order to use this idiom. Let me think. Okay, let's just do it separately for now. Okay. Hmm. What's the best way to handle this? Because you want to be able to use len for stuff like for loops where it should be zero um, when the buffer is, is null so it corresponds to a zero length buffer um, but you also want to be able to use it for these sorts of stack lag idioms where you're doing this uh, l value increment in this case of course it's unconditionally safe because we've made sure we've fitted stuff all right, let's just leave it like that for now. I'll think about that. I, I mean, I've, I've solved that problem before. I just, it's been a while. So uh, let's return to that later. So, all right, let's see if this actually does something reasonable. A free undefined, yeah, let's define that. So yeah, we have to free not the buffer pointer, but the header. And otherwise we just do nothing. So does the zero check? Um, actually, before we jump into the assembly code, let's just uh, look at it in memory in the debugger. So buff, you can see it in the I'll figure out a way to increase the text size. I think that's probably pretty small. But anyway, it starts out as null as, as we expected. Now there's actually, um, actually something there. Uh, okay, that's definitely a bug. So we'll fix that. But you can see it went in there. It's just doing it at the wrong offset. So it, this means that it's 
zero zero one one. Okay. Yeah, so that's okay. We'll look at that bug. But anyway, you can see that it allocates the buffer and it puts forty two in there. But there's clearly a bug. So let's just read through the code. Or rather, let's um, let's look at this function. So we start with the zero, a null buffer. Ask for a length of one and get element size four. I think the problem is I'm not passing in the header. Um, yeah. No. Anyway, let's let's see here. So if I ask for new cap, it says one, which makes sense because the max of one plus two times zero and one is one, and that is sufficient. And then the new size is four because four times one is four. And we don't have, let's restart that. Um, we don't have a buffer pointer, so we malloc. Oh, I see, I'm not allocating. Right, right, right. It has to be uh, size of offset of um, buff header, buff. So basically what's happening is that I was still thinking, this is one of the traps when doing the, this kind of coding trick, which occurs in other contexts, like in memory allocators as well. Um, you're obviously, the thing you're reallocating is not just the buffer, it's the header as well. It's this whole thing plus the tail. So that was part of what was going on at least. Um, so this is the length of the prefix of the, in the header, and then this is the length of the payload. So let's see if that makes sense. So this is 20, and 8 times 2 plus 4 is 20, so that's good. 8 is the length of size of t. So let's see if, <clears throat> if we're better off here. Length zero cap one. Now let's look at this buffer. So this still has the same issue, it seems, except 42 is not even here now. Um, let's go back to this. Um, new header buff. Why didn't that work? New header. Oh. So this is all the uninitialized memory. Oh, I see. I have to also add the offset. <clears throat> okay. Where is this coming from? It's doing the grow, and it's doing the assign. So, I'm sure this is painful to watch, by the way. So, please allow me the indulgence uh, of getting up to speed on this stuff. It's been a while. Um, all right. So, I get in the buffer pointer, new capacity times element size, new header, we allocate the right thing, 
put in the right length, the right capacity. And then we, I mean, I guess you could also do it like this. That's more readable. Oh, that's why. It's because I'm doing pointer arithmetic with the wrong granularity. Okay, that actually worked. Yeah, so I should probably explain in case it wasn't obvious. But basically, I was, oops, what did I delete? Oh, there we go. Um, I was doing this, which would have been fine if this had been a char pointer, but because it was a buff header pointer, this is not the right thing. And this is also much more readable. But of course, you could do the pointer arithmetic manually, but that's not good coding style. All right. So um, I think you guys didn't see my printf window, right? Because I'm using OBS and it's considered a separate window. Um, let me do, yeah, anyway, I, I, let's just step in the debugger, I guess. So you can see it. Let's do a bunch of this crap. So 42. Um, okay. Let's, um, I guess let's do something a little more stressful. Like let's just do a buff push for a bunch of crap. Um, and, uh, You know, let's first assert that <clears throat> after pushing all that crap, the buffer length is actually what it's supposed to be. And then let's assert that um, that all of these elements are what we pushed. So let's first step to the assert line. So that passes. Okay. Oh yeah, I should mention that too. I mentioned you can use Control F10 for starting the program running at a given line. So if I'm on this assert line, I want to make sure I step past the initial push phase. Control F10 goes there, but I can also use it while debugging. Now, now I want to go over this block. I'm just going to use Control F10 and, um, and it will run until that point. Really useful because you know, it has kind of the same meaning regardless of whether you're debugging or editing. And so there's not this kind of mental model switch between what key bindings to use and what they roughly mean. So anyway, um, let me just quickly look at the chat. So it's already been one hour um, and we haven't gotten any parsing, which I think is, I, I hope maybe hope to get there sooner. Uh, I think I'll go at least two hours this time for the stream. Um, so we can actually get to some more stuff. But I do think this stuff is foundational. And even if some people were kind of chomping at the bit to do a lot of parsing today, um, we needed to code this. And I didn't just want to copy an existing library. I want you to understand how it works. Uh, and hopefully, you can see how it's useful. Um, you don't have to have templates that create versions of dynamic array types for every possible element type. Um, but let me just go and read the chat to, uh, to see if there's any questions or if people caught any other bugs just reading code. So. Let me just go and read chat. Oh, my cam C order screwed up. Oh God, that's what I get for not reading the stream during. Uh... <laughs> there we go. Oh God, I'm so sorry. That's hilarious. <clears throat> All right, let me just catch up. So normally I put Q&A to the end, but uh, this is probably a good time. Someone's complaining about audio buzzing. You can't see menus. All right, let me be brave and try to pull up my power cord so I can remove the AC buzzing. Um, and let me just read back to the chat and see if there's any issues I missed.
Yeah, so people are saying that you know I should be checking chat uh, to avoid AV issues. I'll, I'll try to do that. I was, I used to check my stream all the time when I used to do streaming, um, but it became very distracting. So uh, maybe, um, oh, people are complaining about the the fact that the code is gross. I mean, this is like one of the best quality of life improvements you can make as a C programmer is getting this stuff out of the way, uh, and I want to make sure people understand it. So. I wouldn't, this is not indicative of, you know, coding style in general, but, you know, C, one of the great things about C is you can do stuff like this when push comes to shove, which uh, I'm thankful for. Um, but let's see what people are saying. Yeah, I'm going to switch to display capture, but I need to get my secondary monitor hooked up. Um, and right now I have a laptop in a Cintiq, so it's going to be uh, a little bit dicey, but I'll figure it out for tomorrow, hopefully. Um, so someone's asking why use macros for this kind of thing. Uh, let's see, line 17. What was it? Line 17. Oh, you're right. It's a very good catch. There was, the only reason that worked is because there was something defined in that context. So actually, let me call this something totally else just to make to, to make sure I didn't have any other name collisions like that. Okay, that works. Uh, for, for people who are complaining about you know the pace and stuff like that, um, for gnarly code like this, I don't think you can expect to write much more than you know. Well, maybe more than this, but I probably spent 30 minutes of actual programming. I think that's about right. 50 lines of code in 30 minutes for something that's a little bit non-trivial is about right. So uh, that's what, one of the reasons I won't be doing all the programming on stream. But I, I do actually think this is useful to understand. And if and if this kind of thinking makes your head hurt, then it's a good point also to readjust because you know when we do lower level stuff, it's going to get much more. Uh, brain bending than this, maybe not in terms of macros, but in just in terms of mental models. So hopefully, you know, read over this code and make sure you understand everything about it. There shouldn't, it's actually, I mean, the macro stuff aside, it's not that, it's, it's, it's a standard dynamic array, right? Something like that. All right. Um, for buff header, it looks like you're using buff instead of V. All right. Um, for buff header, it looks like you're using buff instead of V. Let's see here. Okay, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, yeah, anyway, I'll do. Uh, okay, the stream is lagging behind. All right. Um, so let, let me just take a breather and a, and a quick drink, and uh, I guess we'll move into the next stuff. I'm, I'm semi-confident that this works. Someone's asking us to add more functions like reserve, and I, we will add those functions as we need them. But I think you know, the three basic public functions of len, push, and free is basically what you need for most things out the gate. And the other stuff, you can add it uh, over time. All right. Um, so let me just put this into a function. Make sure it still works. Yep. Um, this is kind of similar to the implementation of lists in C Python. Uh, I don't know if that's true. I mean, dynamic arrays are kind of standard thing. Um, I don't know about the macro trick. I haven't seen it elsewhere. I, like, I'm sure someone must have thought of this specific version, but definitely when I first, I haven't seen it. I've only seen it in code bases that were clearly inspired by Sean's code, just based on what community they're a part of. Um, so at least, you know, in, in my part of the world, I think Sean was the first to come up with a specific version. All 
All right. Um, maybe let's let's start doing some parsing or some lexing at least. So you know, lexing. I, I assigned you guys the reading, and uh, hopefully you have some rough idea. Okay, someone's saying that the menus and pop-up windows cannot be seen. I can see stuff on screen. Oh, on stream. I'm, I'm previewing the stream, and I can definitely see most things. One second. So what kind of menus can't be seen? Like right-click menus? Someone's saying the mic is lower than yesterday. The alt menu. Oh, the drop down. I see. I'll switch to uh, full display capture uh, for tomorrow's stream when I set up my monitor. Yeah, I'm using OBS. Um, I might just take like a few minutes to to catch my breath and um, and, and make sure that I caught any uh, technical issues that are lowering the quality for people, and then we'll we'll do more coding for I guess hour two. I see menu bar file edit. Oh, so macros versus functions. Um, that's a good question. Some, I mean, a bunch of it actually could be done using functions, but stuff like push is inherently uh, requires functions inherently because of the uh, the fit. Well, fit does for the both for the the size of, which requires you to know you can't just pass a void pointer, but because at that point you've lost the element type information, and you also need to be able to do this L value assignment. Which you, I guess you could do by passing. Yeah, you could you could do that. Um, the the pointer assignment part you could do that by passing a void pointer pointer and assigning through that. But this seems um, okay since we're already needing it for the size of stuff. Um, and in terms of functions, I mean you could do this stuff with a function, but I feel like once you're doing 90% of it with macros and you want this stuff to be it's like a, a small one liner anyway, you might as well do it with a macro while you're at it. It's just more coherent with the rest of it, I guess. Okay, let me just get a drink real quick. Sounds like the connection is a little bit bad. Um, it's it's always I'm always recording it in high quality and we'll be we'll be uploading it to YouTube and hopefully we can sort out any connection uh, connection issues. All right, yeah, I drink way way too much Coke Zero. I'm I'm kind of notorious for that for people who uh, who know me. Although I've been, uh, I, I stopped drinking Coke Zero after six in order to help my sleep pattern. I actually made a big difference, so I'm, I'm a recovering Coke fiend. All right, let's uh, let's go back to some code. Oh, someone's saying it's not good for for hydration. Yeah, I, I should get something else to drink here, but uh, that was just what I had on my desk. All right. Um, so this was a bit of a digression, but it's kind of foundational, so I thought it was okay to put in there. Um, okay, next steps. Let's, uh, I guess let's do some, some lexing. Um, so we're going to, so, so, you know, so lexing is translating a char stream to token stream. So, you know, for example, uh, one, two, three, uh, X plus Y, uh, I don't know, something like that, uh, translates into, so, 
So I think everyone, I'm not going to go into that. Hopefully you know this stuff. But just so we're clear, it's about, on the one hand, breaking things up, uh, identifying the boundaries of tokens, but it's also about doing some superficial, uh, well, not superficial, doing some kind of assigning some semantics to the tokens. So some tokens like uh, like keywords and uh, symbols, you know, like brackets and plus, they just kind of stand for themselves. There's no real additional semantics, but when you parse something like a an integer, you, an integer, you actually have to turn it into a, an integer. Like, so you have a sequence of, of ASCII digits and you have to turn it into some in-memory representation of an integer. So that's what lexing is in a nutshell. And uh, there's obviously different ways you can write lexers, but we're going to be taking a simple handwritten approach. Um, first, we have to figure out what to do for our token type. Um, oh, and, and this would be token kind. Um, so we're going to have a data structure representing a token. And the primary features for now is just going to be a kind. Well, there would be some more stuff later. And uh, because there will be a bunch of single character uh, tokens like, you know, the aforementioned uh, parenthesis and uh, plus, it's convenient to exploit the fact that we can just use their ASCII representation if we reserve the first 128 um, um, reserve the first 128 um, uh, token kinds for just be kind of literal characters. So that's what we're going to be doing. It's like a standard lexer trick. Um, so you know, let's let's say we wanted to have. Uh, in addition to that, you also want to have, um, you know, you want to have a, an integer, you want to have uh, a name, um, you know, and, and, and other stuff to be determined. And for now, we're going to take a simple representation of a stream. Um, of a stream of characters, which is just a char pointer. And we're going to assume that we're not doing buffered reading. The whole thing has been read in either via a big F read, maybe, or just an in-memory string or, um, you know, M mapping or something like that. But just to keep things simple, we're just going to be using a string pointer for the stream state. So let's see here. <clears throat> Where we'll be structuring it is basically as a kind of a global state machine, meaning there's going to be a global token that corresponds uh, to the current token. And um, we're going to have a next token function, which basically just, you know, scans the next token and then sets up any relevant, uh, any relevant data in this token struct. So, Like just starting with this very basic stuff as an example, we'll obviously do do more stuff later. Um, the basic idea when you're doing handwritten stuff is, you know, it's just code. You just discriminate based on um, you just discriminate based on you know the first character you're looking at. So in this case, uh, if you have a digit. Um, this is going to be a, uh, a token, what did I call it, token int, um, and there's going to be a bunch of other others that will basically just be literal tokens. So, you know, there's going to be a bunch of different cases, but if you're any other character that's not part of an explicit list, you're going to fall into the default case uh, where we're just going to say the kind is going to be uh, essentially itself. It should be, I guess, char. Um, let's do it like that. Um, and then we're going to increment. Does that make sense? I think so. 
Uh, and then, yeah, if we have something like this, we would have to um, we would have to let's see here. Let's just say while we have digits, we're going to increment. This is not, by the way, like the final version. I'm just stubbing in like the absolutely most basic kind of tokenization you can imagine, just so you can see how it works out. Uh, and then once we're done, we're going to say token end. Okay. And so say we have By the way, when I'm, this is sort of my, my, my poor man's testing approach. I, I tend to just write these functions when I'm writing stuff and I just keep adding them to the top of main. And so they all run all the time when I'm developing, just so I make sure that I don't regress stuff. Um, and then if I have a real thing after here, like this will be like payload after this. So this is just a way for me not to have to run tests separately from the main program when I'm testing and developing. So, um, Let's say we assign the stream so we have some kind of um, source. Um, and for now, it could just be, um, you know, let's just have a bunch of random symbols, but then some digits and some other stuff and another set of things. Um, oh, and one thing that's, yeah, that is, okay, let's try that. So, so yeah, note, note this pretty nice thing. Um, well, it's not that fancy, but oh, this is also wrong. So I guess it's not that nice. Oh, it's because we didn't do the reservation. works. Um, so you can see what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm setting up a watch window with two things. One is the token kind itself, which is normally an enum. And so if the enum value actually matches one of the explicitly defined values, it's going to show the string equivalent. Uh, if, if not, it's just going to show an integer, but then I, here I'm just casting it to a char so I can see the ASCII, uh, the ASCII string equivalent. So, all right, let's see how this goes. Token kind is zero. If token kind is zero. Why did it go into this? Oh, it's after. So now it's done. Okay. So yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the basic idea behind you do stuff. Now let's uh, start attaching some semantics to the tokens. Um, And so, like I said, there's a bunch of tokens that don't have any meaning beyond the fact that they have a certain kind. 
um, but things like integers and identifiers and others have meaning beyond just their type or their kind. Uh, and so we have to also carry that data around with tokens. And um, for example, let's say that um, we have a, uh, you know, for the integer, let's have an int val. It's going to be, maybe I shouldn't call it int if it's a u64, so maybe I'll just call it u64. And I'm going to be scoping this. Let me do the overflowing version first, and then we maybe can talk about overflow. Let's not talk about overflow now. I'll do that next time, which is an important thing to handle, but it's not really essential to getting the point across here. So in order to, to, to parse an integer, this is a very standard uh, left fold. So this is a decimal uh, number, and so you do something like this. Um, so this part here converts, you know, an ASCII digit to the corresponding uh, number. So if it's equal to, to the character zero, you get zero. If it's equal to character one, you get one. Um, and then this multiplication by 10 basically shifts everything you've already computed. Since you're parsing stuff from most significant digit down to the least significant digit, uh, this kind of shifts everything over every time you see a new digit. So... Um, normally write it like that. And uh, so this is the valve, and then you would say, you know, U64 valve. And let's just, actually, let's just call that valve for now. Let's see if that worked. By the way, this is a very, so I mentioned control F10. I'm just going to harp on it because it gets it gets me almost like upset when people don't use this enough. When you're in a loop and you want to step through each iteration to look at a bunch of watch window stuff, don't use F9 because that's a stateful, you know, breakpoint. Just use, just stand on the line you care about and, and lean on control F10. So I'm just pressing control F10 to step through the, the loop. Um, so you can see, yeah, it parsed 1, 2, 3, 4, 1,234 correctly. Um, it doesn't reset token val. So token valve doesn't need to have a meaningful value unless the kind is int, just to be clear. You don't have to zero initialize it because it's a discriminated union. It doesn't have any meaning when it's not the right type. Uh, and here we go, 994, so that looks correct. So so that's, that's, that, that's basically a, a basic numeral parser. Um, let's do identifier parsing. And uh, by the way, I'll show higher performance ways of doing some of these things later, like maybe using tables for some things rather than functions and whatnot. But so this is really just, I'm trying not to uh, to go off in the weeds with, with small scale optimizations. We'll maybe do that later. Um, yeah, so the annoying thing about using a big switch statement for recognizing uh, alphanumeric ones is that they're huge. And so, if you just pardon me for one second, I'll go and write a Python script in the prompt. You, you can't see the window, but it'll take like a second. Um, I'm just going to write a quick few lines of code to uh, to generate that chunk. What happened to C? All right, um, let's do it for uppercase. Oh, it's because I did <laughs> I did a, ra a Python range and was treating it as an inclusive upper bound, which is not how it works. Okay. You know, this is how you feel accomplished. Like if your boss is telling you you need to check in more lines of code, you go and write stuff like this, and then you write a two-line script to uh, generate 50 lines of code or whatever that was. All right. Um, 
So if we're looking at something alphanumeric, we're going to we're going to save off um, the start of the stream. So we know where this, the thing begins, and then we're going to scan until we find the end. And for a normal C style string identifier, um, it's only the first, I guess the first character can also be underscore, so I should include that. Um, let's see here. And but, but anything beyond that can be a digit, right? And, and this is where especially you'd want to use a lookup table rather than functions. But yeah, if is alphanumeric, um, If it's alphanumeric or it's an underscore, and we keep scanning. And now we're at the end. And so the interval from start to end represents our identifier. And we have to. Well, we should be interning it, which we'll do in a second. But for now, let's just say we're going to store the start and the end um, correctly. Just uh, sort of look it up on demand. Uh, so this is token name. All right. One thing to note is that because we store this as a substring of a larger string, the substring is not null terminated. So you have to be careful about, you know, just using start as a normal C style string pointer if you're passing it to a context that expects the sub, you know, the thing to be null terminated. So the whole th the whole string will be null terminated the way we're doing it now, but the substring won't, right? At least for now, or We'll do something with interning in a second to uh, to clean all this up and make it more practical. But for now, let's just do this to test. Um, and then for this test case, actually, and so I think it would probably be useful to just do like a print token. We, I'm going to make it a value rather than using the global one so we can use it more generally. Um, and so... Let's see, we print this, we print this for everything, but then we do a switch. And for some things like, like names and uh, these ints, I guess I should reverse the order. We're going to um, Going to going to print it out. Um, and this is God, I can never remember the exact order of these things. Is it like this? <clears throat> I guess we'll find out. Otherwise, I just will rearrange the dots. Uh, in case you don't know this idiom, one of the more useful idioms, um, it's one actually. It's one of the only areas in the C standard library with strings where you can actually work cleanly with non-zero non terminated substrings. But the idea behind this is, and I can't remember if no, it's, I think it's this. Uh, if you have this star, it basically means there's an additional printf argument which specifies the length of the substring you want to show, uh, and then followed by the you know the normal string pointer. But this means that you can just compute the length on demand, and it will only print that substring. 
So um, let's do do random stuff like this. Actually, let's do that in a more clean way. So, um, It's interesting. This is, by the way, the kind of thing shutting out compiler warnings by casting uh, is a bad habit. But um, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm basically not 100% convinced that I remembered the right uh, uh, format specifier order. And until I, I verify that, there's no point in fuzzing over types of that. So, okay, let's look at this stuff. Actually, let's um, because Windows sucks about printf style standard out uh, display in the actual editor. Like I can see it on another window, but I want to make sure you guys can easily see it. Um, instead, let's do just for now. This is placeholder. I have to figure out a better way to uh, show other windows. But for now, for today, we'll have to do like this. What did I do? Oh, shut up. So I just have to define some. screwed for now. This will still compile on other platforms. Okay. Um, so what do we want to look at? Okay, I guess we just want to step through them and see if all the, the identifier stuff worked out. Oh yeah, and so now I'm going to
Why can't I just see it as a nice string? Oh, I can. Ugh, this is annoying. All right, let's go back to just printf, and then I'll do it a little bit differently. And also show you a cool debugger trick if you're a Windows, if you're a Visual Studio user. Um, so normally, if you have a string pointer, like um, suppose I do start here. Let's see, so so now we got hello. Um, but you can see that, like I said, it's just the prefix that starts at hello. We, we can't actually continues too far. Um, but you can do this. Right? No? Oh, I have to use brackets. Let me make this wider. See what I'm doing. Um, in general, if you do something like this, you will see... So you, you take a, a, an array or a pointer, and you do comma 10, and we'll show you the first... 10 elements, um, but you can actually also use dynamic expressions like this. But I th yeah, I think you have to use square brackets. Let's see if that works. Yep, so that works. <clears throat> Let's just restart and verify that everything looks peachy keen. Um, first there's a plus, then there's a open paren, close paren, a name, and it contains, it includes the underscore, the alphabetics, and the digit. Then there should be a comma, then there should be a integer. Okay, so that didn't work. What happened there? Okay. It's <laughs> a real noob. That's what happens when you don't actually look at your output window, but I guess that kind of makes sense that I wouldn't. Visual Studio is still pestering me. So where are we? This was a two, three, four. It should be a plus. So we have a name and it's foo, then we should have an exclamation mark, and we should have 994. And then we should be done. Okay. So that's a very basic uh, start of Elixir for, you know, digit sequences that are parsed as, as integers no overflow checking, and uh, an identifier parser that doesn't do any interning or anything like that for now. Um, but as basic as this is, maybe I'll stop doing the official recording at this point. I will continue streaming afterwards, but I think uh, one, in, one hour and 40 minutes is already getting a bit long for the kind of main video. So I will, um, I will, I will stop recording, uh, but if you uh, if you want, uh, you can watch the, the rest of the stream and, and stay around. So let me just stop recording and then I'll look at the chat.